So I just want to back up a couple because I think uh, there's still some confusion about what a restriction enzyme is and exactly what it does. And although I indicated a three prime hydroxyl and a five prime phosphate, let me show you. This is the way a lot, at least a large class of restriction enzymes went. We've seen uh, a deoxyribose backbone before with a phosphate backbone going on up to the next nucleotide. This is the five prime position. This is the three prime position. There's a phosphate here. It goes down to the next one. It goes down like this. So when I'm showing you G-A-A-T-T-C, five prime to three prime, Here's the first, here's where I indicated the first cut comes from. And I indicated that the cleavage generates a G with a three prime hydroxyl, and the G ends up with a five prime phosphate. So what that means is that the hydrolysis happens right there so that after cleavage what you end up with is a five prime phosphate and a three prime hydroxyl. This is paired with a, with a C on the opposite strand. It makes one cut here, and then it would make the identical cut on the, on the opposite strand. So if we were to pull those apart, this strand here would have G with this three prime OH, and the, the other strand would be TTAA. And if we were to pull this one apart, we'd have AATTC, the G, a three prime OH here, a five prime phosphate there, a five prime phosphate there. Again, you have to remember this strand is going five prime, three prime in that direction. This one is going five prime, three prime in the end. And the beauty of, of, this, of these restriction enzymes, at least it's not true of all of them, but it's true of a lot of them, is they generate these what are called sticky ends. You can pull them apart, and it's a little, they come back together, they'll reform those base pairs. So it's almost like having little bits of Velcro at the end and when this end is looking for a complementary sequence to pair with, it doesn't know what's out here, and it doesn't know what's out there. All it sees is this. So I can cut this and rejoin it, or I can cut them, pull it apart, take another piece of DNA that's been cut with the same enzyme, and therefore has the same corresponding little sticky ends on each end, and it could insert right in the middle. And that's the principle of... of um, of cloning, and it was the development of these, if you will, magic scissors that uh, made possible, made it possible to take this DNA which looked so homogeneous, nothing but GAs, Ts, and Cs, uh, and then cut it up in defined ways. When I, uh, I told you, when I was a uh, postdoc, a friend of mine had just purified two million dollars worth of EcoR1 because he he purified some of this enzyme at that point. The only way to get these things was to, to produce them yourself and purify them. Now there are literally hundreds of these, and they recognize different sequences. And what people, once people understood that they existed, then they just started to look in different, usually they're from bacteria, and they just looked in different bacteria and, uh, until they found another one, and then they purify it. So um, if you go to, uh, say, any of the, the companies that uh, do stuff for recombinant DNA. You'll find lists like this. Uh, you, you can, the funny little abbreviations, sort of like the ECOR1, usually have something that tells you some abbreviation related to the organism uh, from which the restriction enzyme was isolated. And you can find things that will cut, I won't say every sequence, but very, very uh, many sequences. There are literally hundreds of these, and you just order them, and the next day a FedEx package arrives with a little bit of the enzyme that will cut at that 
cut at that sequence. The, another concept that seemed to be a problem was what was, what's a vector? So if you understand that there are sequence specific molecular scissors, then if we have a piece of DNA and there's an ECOR1 site here, it would sort of be, kind of think of it like that because it's going to cut in this slightly skewed way. Maybe there's another one right here. Another one over here. If we take this DNA and cut it with this uh, particular enzyme, we're going to get a break here, then this will get this piece running from here to here, we'll get this little piece here, we'll get this piece here, and we'll get whatever goes off on those sides. So that's naked DNA in a test tube. And if, so I could cut any piece of DNA at some sites generating a bunch of fragments. Now, if I just took those fragments and transformed them into E. coli, I took naked DNA, took it from the outside, put it inside, is it going to replicate? No. Why not? Because there's a special signal called the origin replication that says, start replicating DNA here. This came from a piece of human, let's say, some of my DNA. It would not have a signal in it that said to the E. coli replication machinery, start, start copying DNA right here. So the sort of principle of, apart from being able to cut DNA into fragments, is you have to get it to replicate so you can make lots and lots of copies. So the trick is to attach the DNA, at least a widely used trick, is to attach the DNA to something that has an origin of replication that will work in the organism in question. And that was what we call a vector. So this is, a, this is an E. coli cell. Another thing that's very confusing is all the circles that show up in this course. This is huge. The vector was double-stranded DNA that maybe, let's say, had a unique ECOR1 restriction site in it. That's the only ECOR1 restriction site. The other thing it would need to have is an origin of replic DNA replication. So that's why this plasmid is able to propagate itself. This little circle of DNA is able to propagate itself. And then some kind of selectable marker. And most of the time, that's a drug resistance, although it doesn't have to be. And if we cut that here, generate sticky ends, then we could take this fragment and stick it in here to give this piece here, join to the vector. So that's vector, and that's an insert. Let's say it was that piece, that piece there. In fact, if you wanted to clone D DNA in E. coli and then have it have the plasmid work in uh, in yeast. If you just take that plasma that works in e the vector with its insert that works in E. coli and put it in yeast, it won't replicate either. And that's because these other languages other than the genetic code are not universal. So you'd have to put also in a sequence that said to the yeast replication machinery, start something here. People call that a shuttle vector, something that will replicate in E. coli or replicate in yeast. And the same principle applies to other organisms. OK. Now, Probably the trickiest thing, the thing where I sort of muddled it yes, uh, on Friday, and I apologize for that, was this discovery of, of restriction enzymes. And again, some of you are frustrated. You said, how could this, why do I waste time? Why don't I just tell you stuff that's on the exam? Okay, again, people were talking about molecular scissors when I was uh, an undergrad and a grad student, and chemists were trying to think of the, if they could come up with some way where you could get some specificity into how to cutting DNA. And the answer, the discovery of restriction enzymes didn't come from that kind of experiment. It came from somebody trying to understand what seemed to be a really obscure piece of biology. And I'm just going to, Julia made up a lovely little slide. What I think what basically I did was I left out one of the little layers that I usually show. So let me just talk. Here's what, again, what, um, 
Luria saw when he was doing these experiments. So I'm going to tell you now what was in strain A and B, and maybe that will help now. But I wanted you at first to see it without knowing what anything beyond what Luria knew. OK, strain A has no restriction enzyme. no modification enzyme. And although there are different types of edit modification enzymes, there are, are two, um, most of, many of them are methylases, so we'll, we'll call that. And this one has a restriction enzyme. Um, and it has corresponding methylase. And just to review that again, if you can figure this pretty much out from first principles, that if you were an organism and you had a restriction enzyme that would cut this, there are two things you can possibly do to keep from cutting up your own DNA. One is to ne never have that sequence appear in your DNA. That would prevent you from cutting up your own DNA, even though it has it. It becomes pretty constraining now, because it's somewhere in a particular protein. You might need that little bit of sequence to encode something that you need to make a critical protein. So <clears throat> instead, what you find is organisms that have a restriction enzyme have those sequences, but they don't cut up their own DNA because they modify their own DNA by putting in, this, in the case of this one, they put a methyl group here, and I drew that out the other day. You can see you can put a methyl group on the, on, on, um, the ex exocyclic amino group of adenine and not interfere with base pairing. But what you can do is interfere with the way that the restriction enzyme sees that sequence. And when the cell pulls the DNA apart, each of the old strands is methylated, and the new strand is initially not methylated, but that's enough to keep the restriction enzyme from doing its thing. And then the methylase will come along, find the sequence, and then the progeny strand, the daughter strand, will be ending up methylated. So once you get DNA methylated, you can propagate it as long as you have the methyl group. So that was, this was what was really underlying what Luria did, but he didn't know that. And so let me just quickly go through this again. So he took, he grew the strain, the phage on strain A, okay? No restriction enzyme, no, it's just plain old DNA. And if he plates, so he picks a plaque that's probably about a, a billion, uh, yeah, a billion phage in, in a plaque, somewhere around 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th phage, probably in a, in a uh, no, that's probably not true. A little, if, a little bit less than that, but somewhat less than that, but lots and lots of phage particles in that plaque. So we just resuspend them and then plate them out and of course it grew on strain A, that's what it was growing on, that wouldn't surprise you at all. The surprise was, even though he knew he had lots and lots of phage, hardly any of them grew on strain B, but he found a rare plaque that had learned to grow. And he tested then, and this thing grows on strain B, that was not a surprise, because it had to grow on strain B to be up there, and he tested, and it still grew on strain A. So up till now, everything he knew, everything we've talked about in that course, you think, aha, this original phage couldn't grow on strain B, but it's mutated somehow. It's learned to grow on strain B because of a mutation. Okay? That would be a perfectly reasonable explanation. But if that were the case, what would have happened? Well, it was growing on those phage, you pick them again, they should still grow on, on A and B, the ones from here, and they still do. The problem with that model was they grew in strain A, we had trouble growing in strain B, now you learn to grow in strain B, but you hadn't forgotten how to grow on strain A. But if you take the ones that were growing on strain A, they grow in strain A, not a surprise, that's what they're growing in here. This is the problem right here. 
if this was a mutant, you know, permanent change, then we should have been able to have it grow on strain A as well. So what was really happening in there? Well, at the beginning, the phage DNA was lacking any kind of modification, grew fine on strain A because there was no restriction enzyme. When it went into strain B, that now had a, an enzyme, a restriction enzyme, that cut up any time it found that sequence. And so most of the phage that injected their DNA, those DNAs were trashed by the restriction enzyme. But there is a, a methylase in there that's also able to methylate those sequences. And what happened somewhere along the way was that there was the methyl 1 on one phage DNA and got enough methyls on there that the phage could be replicated before it got cut up by the restriction enzyme. Once the phage molecule has methylations on the site, it's able to grow just fine in strain B, and it'll be able to do it forever. Um, however, if you take that, meth that DNA with the methyls on it, and we put it back in strain A, well, it still grows. This one doesn't have any kind of restriction enzyme. But while it's growing, it's busy losing all the methyls again, and we're right back to where we started from. Okay, an obscure experiment, probably one of the most obscure you could get. Many people would have paid no attention. This does not seem worth it, but nevertheless, so the phenomenon was called restriction. They had to give it a name. It wasn't mutation. They said this phage DNA was being restricted somehow when it grew on strain B. People called then, postulated there must be a restriction enzyme that was doing this restricting of phage growth when they found out what was doing it they had discovered magic scissors that would cut DNA at particular sequences. So the point here again, to try and go back and do this, I hope some of you will get this anyway, that many of the really important discoveries come out of basic research. They're easy to ridicule. Why would I spend money on cancer or the human disease or something for somebody studying some little weird phenomenon about phage? But if you want to trace back to the experiment, that sort of started the biotech industry, it was the discovery of restriction enzymes. It took a little while to discover what it was, but the reason they were discovered were people were trying to understand that phenomenology. Once we got restriction enzymes, we already had ligase, which is sort of the tape we'd need. And just to show you here, when we go back to this one, you can see if we put these together again, we have a three prime hydroxyl and a five prime phosphate. That's what DNA ligase knows how to do, because that's how you seal up the end of an Okazaki fragment. So that particular part of the, of the uh, molecular biology toolkit was already known to molecular biologists who'd been studying DNA replication. OK, so if we took some DNA from anything, and we cut it up uh, into pieces like this. And then we joined them with a vector that had been cut. So that it, let's just sort of open it up a little bit. And then this fragment would go in here into one vector molecule. This fragment would insert into another vector molecule, and so on and so forth. Then we would have what I said was a library. And uh, the problem at this point is you if you trans so you transform those into E. coli, and now we have a whole series of E. coli. They have their, their own chromosome, every one of them, because they, they still have to be a, a bacterium. Let's, say, let's take three members of E. coli from this, this library, and they'll all have this, this vector, but they'll have, let's say, insert number one, Two, number three. This, this insert is little. Insert, this insert was bigger. And so on. If we did it right, we'd have every possible fragment of DNA from that original source sitting in its own vector. And the whole collection of E. coli in this uh, population um, 
and it's turned to library. And the next part of the trick was how do you find the thing you want, especially if you take my DNA with three billion D, uh, base pairs, and that's an awful lot of restriction fragments. No matter what I do, it, how do you go about doing it? So the experiment that I showed you at the end, the, the lecture, cloning by complementation, uh, is fairly simple, and it was the, one of, it's basically the first method that was used to find genes in recombinant library. And that would be, for example, to take something that had a his gene mutation in the chromosomal DNA. This is what the situation I described the other day. And so if we put the library into every such that the, the bacterium we transformed the library into was broken for its his G gene, then that mutant couldn't grow on minimal medium unless we put in added histidine. But if one member of that library had the wild type his G gene, let's say it was this, this one here, maybe it had several genes on it, but let's say over here we had his G plus, then this strain is back to being able to synthesize histidine because it's got all the enzymes. And what I was pointing out was this really is complementation, just like we did in that phage cross. We've got one broken copy of the gene, you get a good copy, and all you need is one good copy and you're back in business. And what I was saying at the end of the lecture was this is not a general solution though. If I wanted to find the corresponding histidine gene from my, my DNA and all these biosynthetic pathways pretty much, they arrived, rose so, so early in evolution, the biochemistry is essentially identical in all cells. Could I use this approach to find the same gene from my DNA? What do you think? Why don't you turn to somebody beside you and see if you can talk for a minute and then let's see if I can think of at least a couple of problems. See if you can come up with one or two. I'm, talk for a minute. Somebody Find somebody near you and see if you can come up with anything. Any, anybody want to volunteer uh, an idea why it wouldn't work? Or does somebody think it would? <laughs> no ideas? Anyone? God, it's Monday. <laughs> I feel like most of you guys, somebody, come on. What do you think? Going to work? No idea. What has to happen for it to work? What has to happen to work? I'll give you a vector that has my gene corresponding to that enzyme. It's in E. coli. I need to make the protein. Yeah? No, it's in the vector. The vector has, we've cloned it into an E. coli uh, vector. So that's got it, yeah. Well, it'll have a language that'll say start transcription, but whose language is it going to have? It's going to have human, my transcriptional stuff. Will that work in E. coli? No. It's not universal. Even though the open reading frame is fine. That's good. How about translation? I didn't even tell you about that, but there's actually some specific stuff needed that's not universal either. So when you get the RNA, you still have to translate it. There's another thing that might mess us up. Do you remember anything else about gene? Yeah? Introns and exons? What if my gene has introns in it, which it almost surely has? You have to get rid of those. Coli doesn't know what they are. It's not used to taking them out. 
You see the, you see the issues? So this is, although that's a cute thing and that helped you find a gene from E. coli by complementing an E. coli mutant, or maybe you could do it with yeast if you had a vector that would replicate in yeast. It wasn't a general solution. So people have had to use a whole variety of different ways. Here's another way. Now you, you know that um, genetic, you have that genetic code that was worked out years ago. So let's say I was a biochemist and I'd found a protein that I was interested in and I purified it and I got it out to a single protein and then I could cut it up with things that that proteases that will cut the protein into pieces and their ways of sequencing protein. I'm not going to tell you how it works in this, in this course. We just don't have time. But you can get a sequence of little pieces of protein. And let's imagine that this was the sequence of part of the protein that I purified. It's one of my enzymes. And I'd like to, I'd like to find the gene. Well, how could I use that information to uh, to figure out uh, where the gene is in this library. So here's the strategy. We get out the genetic code, which Gobind Karana and, and uh, Marshall Nuremberg help work out. Uh, and we say, OK, alanine. And if you look it up, what you'll find is that it's G, C, and then it can be A, T, C, or G. It can be any of those. If we look up what's the codon for aspartate, we'll find there's a G or an A, but it could be T or it could be C. If we look up lysine, we'll see the A, but it could be A or G. You'll notice the variation of these things is almost all the third codon, if that hadn't struck you. Same thing with threonine, A, C, and then this is another one. There are four codons that, in, that encode this, and this one, uh, asparagine, is uh, is that so? Knowing that piece of the protein doesn't define a unique sequence. But what we could do is we could synthesize what's called a mixed probe, and that would mean when we were going to synthesize this DNA. We'd start with a G building block, and then we'd add a C building block. So now we made G and C. And at the next step, we'd add an equal mixture of A, T, G, and C. So what we would get out of that would be we'd be getting G, and then the next biosynthetic step would give us G, C, and then the next biochemical step would give us G, C, T, or let's say A, G, C, T, G, C, C, and G, C, G. At the next step, we'd add uh, a G, so every one of these would get a G, every one would get an A, and then the next step, they would branch. And if you follow that out, you'll see by the end, you have a mixture of probes. One of them is going to be the right uh, the right one that you find in the DNA. Now, if you work out the number of possibilities, you'll discover that most of the time, there's only going to be one probe that's, that's unique. Once you get to about 20 nucleotides, any sequence on average is you know, represented once in the human genome. So as long as you make the probe long enough, you'll find usually you'll, one, of, one of the things in your mixture will be a defined probe. So what we then take is we have all these different pieces of DNA that are the, the, the logical variants you can see here. And then we would label the probe with P32. It's a radioactive isotope. And it's uh, very easy. You can add it to a 5 prime hydroxyl. There's a special enzyme that will very easily take the terminal phosphate from ATP and put it over. We don't, it doesn't really for this course how we get it there, but what we can do is radioactively active label the probe. So now we've got this mixture. And somewhere in this library is a piece of DNA that's going to have the gene that's encoding the protein that we're interested in. So how do you go about trying to, to deal with that? So, we'll do is our plate our E. coli library 
onto a bunch of Petri plates. So we'll get, I won't put too many colonies on here so we can sort of see, see a pattern, um, but we'd have probably a lot of them and we'd have a bunch of plates. Uh, you can work out statistically how many plates you have to have to have a chance of finding your, your gene of, of interest. Then what we do, lay a membrane on the plate. It's a particular type of, of, of membrane. And what we'll, that will do is it'll make a copy of everything that's there. And we're going to save the plate. And then we're going to treat the membrane. Okay, we've got now, for, we've got a membrane that's got an identical pattern of, of back, they've got some of the bacteria from the colonies stuck at the corresponding parts on the membrane. We're going to lyse the, back, the E. coli. That means break them open so all their insides spill out. And we will denature the DNA by treating with a condition. You can, for example, vary the pH and make the strands come apart. And that gives single-stranded DNA. It's SS I'm using as an abbreviation for single-stranded. The strands are pulled apart. And this sticks to the membrane. So now we've got at every one of these little positions on the membrane is something that looks like this. Here's the membrane and there's some sort of uh, single-stranded DNA that's stuck to the membrane in that fashion. The DNA that's stuck here came from the bacterium here that had a particular insert. Over here, we have all the E. coli DNA and the vector DNA, but it will have a different piece of DNA in the vector. Everybody with me? OK, so if we were now to take our um, radioactive probe that we made up there and get the conditions just right, that single-stranded probe will come in, and it will try and find its complement. It will form hydrogen bonds, because that's the lowest energy well in the, we think about it thermodynamically. And if we can get it right, the temperature and the conditions right, nothing will stick unless it's an exact match to the sequence. And if we get the right probe that can form hydrogen bonds with with everything along here, and it's got P32 at this point, what will happen is we'll have now, the probe will stick, let's say, to this particular uh, colony. And now we have radioactivity right there. So put some photographic film. over the membrane. And right here, there's P32, and that'll expose the film and nowhere else. And then when we develop it, what we'll find is one, if this works well anyway, one spot. So now we know that that piece, that colony, had a piece of human DNA in it that was uh, related to the, the sequence that from the protein that I had purified. So we go back to this colony. I think I things have probably migrated around a little bit here, but let's move this up just a little bit, make it look a little better. So this one is this one is this one. So now I can go back to this colony, pick it out, and let's say it's this insert. So now I've found, I can sequence the rest of that, that piece of DNA. We'll talk about how we sequence DNA in the next next lecture. So that's an alternative way of, of uh, sequencing, uh, of identifying a clone of interest. 
there was a particularly painful way of sequencing gene, uh, finding a gene in a library that we, for the most part, do not have to do anymore. It was called positional cloning. And for example, the gene for, the gene that when it's broken causes cystic fibrosis. It's a very difficult disease. The humans who, who have cystic fibrosis have a very, very tough time. And so there was a great deal of interest in finding the gene that was broken in these patients. Now, what you had, human geneticists, I showed you something about pedigrees. They would have a, a chromosome. They might have banding patterns. And they would have figured out that somewhere along this uh, <coughs> chromo chromosome that the gene for cystic fib <coughs> fibrosis lay somewhere between two genetic markers that they had identified. Now, the amount of DNA between something that you knew what the gene was here and something you knew what the gene was there could be huge. It could be many, many, many times the size of the E. coli chromosome. So what people would do is they get, they clone something from here, a little piece of DNA from there, and also clone something and they get a little piece of DNA from there. And then they go into the library and they try and find something that had this DNA and, it, and something that extended in this direction a little bit. So by this sort of thing, you'd have marker A somewhere in the middle with cystic fibrosis gene, but you didn't know exactly where. You'd clone a little piece of DNA and you'd use that to find another one that overlapped with it. And then you'd find, use that to find another piece of DNA. And you kind of walk your way over this way and you'd start the same process at the other end. And every one of these things was the same kind of operation that we've got here. So cycles and cycles and cycles of acquiring the next adjacent piece of DNA and working your way along here. And you had to use more than one different, restric different restriction enzymes, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get these overlaps. And by doing that, eventually they were able to get all the DNA that was between these markers. They knew the cystic fibrosis gene was there from their, the recombinant, uh, the maps they had made by studying human pedigrees. And that was, uh, and then you'd start, once you knew the sequence, then you'd take candidate genes and you'd take a bunch of cystic fibrosis patients and you'd start to see if every person who had cystic fibrosis had a mutation in that gene and eventually they got it. That process in the case of cystic fibrosis uh, took something like, it took five years to do that with a huge team of people. Uh, and I guess it was from 1985 to 1990. If you wanted to do that experiment today, we come now to probably one of the most widely used ways of finding uh, a gene of interest. And that is, you go to your computer, the whole human genome sequence is in there. If we were to do that experiment today, we'd say, well, I know what this gene is. You'd look that gene up in the, in the database, and you knew what this gene was, and you'd look it up in the database, and you'd just look at all the, the DNA that's in the middle, and you'd see a whole series of open reading frames, and you'd probably say, well, what do I know about the, the, about the biology of cystic fibrosis? Could I make a guess? Is it a membrane protein? Is it not a membrane protein? And you, you, there are certain characteristics that would probably allow you to make a guess. And then you could jump right in and start sequencing DNA from a person. You could do the, start the experiment practically that afternoon instead of five years later. So if you look back in the literature, you'll find some of the key genes in, in human, in fact, in human biology were isolated by this very painful process of positional cloning. And it's sort of you hardly ever have to do that now. There may be the odd case where something's needed, but most of the stuff now, there are these amazing databases, um, and I'll give you the, the, open, the um, URL for it at the beginning of, of next lecture. And I'll just show you when I had the, uh, if you, this is some, an experiment in which someone took this gene for 
cystic fibrosis. It is a membrane protein, and it's one of those proteins that mediates the passage of ions across a, a channel, a, a cha a chloride ions across the, uh, across the membrane. And if, you, if that gets broken, you end up with cystic fibrosis. What someone done, has done here is they've taken that green fluorescent protein gene and they fused it to the end of the cystic fibrosis gene. So you can tell where the cystic fibrosis gene is localized in a lung cell by looking to see where the fluorescence is. And I think you can see that the fluorescence is out there uh, along the, um, along the uh, membrane. OK, so uh, at the beginning of uh, next lecture, I'll t introduce you to how we take one of these recombinant uh, plasmids and make what's called a restriction map. It's a, using a very simple little piece of apparatus like that. Then we'll go in and tell you about DNA sequencing and this PCR technique you've heard, polymerase chain reaction that you've heard so much about. Okay?